would you put up, if there is a sign there, tearing down, there we go. That's what I want to be up there. I want you all to look at that very closely. And you'll get more of an understanding, hopefully, as time goes on. Why we ask about you being born again. Because Jesus, for number one, said it was a major necessity. Vera, afterwards I would like for you to speak, both with Connie and with Sister Rose Gutierrez, because they are ones that have gone through and walked the journey that you're getting ready to walk. Warning. There's two attributes of God that we overlook at times. We never overlook the attribute of love. As a matter of fact, that's what we hear. That's pretty much one of the only attributes we hear about. But there is also the attribute of discipline. Because of his love, he does show discipline. And many times in his word, that word discipline is overlooked because it's called wrath. And we don't realize that wrath is God's discipline, not his judgment. We will face his judgment when he returns. And when he comes back and sets up his kingdom, we will face his judgment. But in between, we will also see God's wrath or God's discipline. God longs and tries everything within us to protect us and stop us from making harmful choices. He will warn us again and again. He will warn us of the consequences of the choices. He will warn us of the dangers of the choices over and over. Our Lord and our Savior will put these danger wrong way, turn back signs all through our life to warn us to be careful on the path that we are following. In his word, he has given us written examples and illustrations of the consequences of the bad choices. And yet, nonetheless, out of his love, His mercy and compassion, he gives us the freedom to make those choices. He does not treat us as puppets and robots. And yet with all of that, there is within the church, as well as the world society, a growing epidemic of deception There is a deception in the church today and you are not being warned that you must be born again. You're not being taught that there is a rebirthing of your spirit from God above and that he will place within you a new spirit and that new spirit, the Holy Spirit, will then take and write on the tablets of your heart his laws of love his laws and disciplinary actions he will in essence place boundaries in your life and when you get too close or violate one of those boundaries his Holy Spirit will convict you and at that point you are to Wash at the brazen labor. In essence, Lord, I am sorry. Please forgive me. And then move away from that boundary that you have crossed. I thank and praise God. I had a father when I was growing up and a mother that loved God and disciplined me. They set boundaries and I knew where those boundaries were. And as I got older, those boundaries would expand with the responsibility that I had in my mind and my growth of maturity. But if I got too close to that boundary or crossed that boundary, 
there was times that I would hear, you wait till I get you home. And trust me, I never was saying, oh, I'm so excited, let's go on home now. (laughs) Never did I ever want to get on home. But guess what? When I got that statement, you wait till I get you home, I knew that I had crossed the boundary and I began to come back within the guidelines of where I was supposed to be. I knew that the consequences of going beyond that boundary would most likely play out. And no, I was not abused. And no, I don't think my personality was warped. Now, I know there's a lot of people that does. But I don't think that my dad's discipline warped my personality. Nor did it cause me to end up being a very hateful individual to go out and try to destroy people. But rather it taught me to have a respect and a fear. Not a fear of wanting to be around him, but a fear of knowing that I needed to stay close to those boundaries and not get outside of those boundaries. But there is an epidemic of deception that's growing in the church. And today in the church, we don't want to hear warnings. We do not want messages coming across that would tell us this is wrong, that is wrong. And if we get them, we get angry, we get upset, we get frustrated, and we get offended. And yet, in our society, in the world, as well as the church, we only want positive words. Words that makes us feel good about ourselves going beyond the boundaries. We only want to hear the positive words that will help justify our choices and our decisions and try to soothe the consequences of our choices and try to justify why the consequences are there. We want words that increase our self-esteem and enhance our self-image. And anything negative will be rejected and pushed as being totally out of hand. And our itching ears will begin to scream, don't tell me I'm on the wrong path. You see, in some respects, there's only two paths mentioned. There is a way that seems right to man, and there is God's way. Now, the one that seems right to man has been broken down for us into three categories. Cain, and if you read the story of Cain, you will know that Cain's way was doing it the way he wanted to do it, irrespective of what God had shared. Now, I have a pretty good idea that God shared with Cain and Abel what he expected, and he gave them his guidelines because the Scripture says, by faith, Abel was obedient and did what God asked him to do. And Romans says, faith comes by hearing, hearing the Word of God. So I got a pretty good idea that God told both Cain and Abel, what they expected, but Cain decided he would do it the way he wanted to do it and then expect God to bless it. Can I use a a really probably bad analogy here? How many of you will give me graces for just one bad analogy in my life? Well, only a few of you. So those of you who raise your hand, come to me after the service. The rest of you, I don't want to upset you. Now I forgot what I was going to say anyhow. (laughs) But then there's the way of Balaam. And Balaam is also one of the ways that man thinks is good to go. And that is to have no boundaries whatsoever. There are no boundaries. Go any way that you want to. And everything is going to be okay. I'm okay. You're okay. You just enjoy the walk. And then the third one that's listed in man's way is Korah. 
And so we don't want to hear that we might be on the wrong way. We don't want somebody to tell us, be careful, you're on Cain's path, you're on Balaam's path, you're on Korah's path. Korah's was in rebellion. Right out just rebelling against anyone that tried to show them the right way, the proper way, that would just reject anything and everything. And they will say, don't tell me that there's danger ahead. By all means, do not warn. Because in our society, in our world, and even in the church, everybody has to win these days. There can be no losers. Everybody gets a trophy. And they've carried that over into their relationship with God. There is no losers. Everybody gets the crown of life, no matter how you live. And yet, the thing that's happening is that they're saying that anyone that warns, anyone that preaches a warning, your preaching is tab as being judgmental. Your preaching is being judged as condemnation. It's being tab as being irrelevant because that's the Old Testament law. As if the New Testament never gave us any warnings whatsoever. They're saying that such preaching is legalism. And going back under the law. Do you remember when I asked you the question, how many was born again? You know why? Because you see, when you're born again, when you're born from above, you become a brand new creature. The old goes away and you become brand new. And he writes on your conscience, on your prefrontal low text lobe in the front he writes his laws his way and then when you get close to going beyond the boundary the holy spirit convicts you and when he convicts you and if you are trying to tell someone else about what God has convicted you, they start saying, you're under the law. I'm not under the law. That's legalism. Might that be a difference between one that's been born again and one that hasn't been born again? Because there is pretty much no conviction in the hearts of people nowadays. Amen? And a matter of fact, Many do not even know what conviction means. And yet God, because He is a Father that loves us, tries His best over and over and over to warn us. Such preaching is deemed to be out of style. It deems to be inappropriated, or inappropriate, excuse me, for our enlightened age that we're living in. We are now living in an enlightened age and where they are saying God is evolving. God is now beginning because of humanity. He is now beginning to understand and evolve and change and God is finally starting to catch up with humanity. So if we try to place warnings, we are deemed as very inadequate and need to catch up with our enlightened age. Years ago, before his death, there was a Christian musician and singer that many of you will know if you're older, younger ones may not know. He died in a plane crash in 1982. His name was Keith Green. Some people loved Keith Green's music. Other people, they just didn't care. But if you was a Keith Green fan, you were a Keith Green fan. And when Keith got killed, there was a lot of broken hearts. But he said one thing. He said, I would rather have people hate me 
with the knowledge that I tried to warn and save them. And you know, I think I kind of have to agree with that because I know there's a lot of people that don't like my preaching. And I know there's a lot of people that would not want to come and sit and listen to me because I'm going to tell them the truth and I'm going to tell them what I feel God has convicted in my heart and what God's Word has shown me to share. And that's the one thing I appreciate so much about Brother Jeff in his Sunday school class and Pastor Steve in his Sunday school class. And as I have gotten to know Pastor Ben and sharing and talking with Pastor Ben, that they are ones that are going to tell you the truth, whether you want to hear it or not, because they don't want to stand before God to give an account. And Keith Green says, I'd much rather be able to, to have them hate me with the knowledge that I tried to help and save and warn them. And I would add from my own part to that, if I may, so that I'm not ruining his statement, but I would add this. I would much rather them not be able to point their finger at me and say, why didn't you love me enough to at least warn me? Why didn't you at least love me enough? Can I ask you a question? Why don't we warn people nowadays? Can I take you to turn with me to a scripture in the book of Ecclesiastes? This is not my message today. Totally. Can I ask you to go to Ecclesiastes? <laughs> not Ecclesiastes, I'm sorry. Ezekiel. My mistake, they both start with an E. How many of you understand that over in the book of Peter, it says that we are a kingdom of priests? How many of you accept the fact that you are a kingdom of priests? Amen? How many of you know that a priest was a go-between? A representation, a representative of God. Amen? The, to, on the behalf of the people. How many of you actually understand that a priest or you and I as a member of the body of Christ should be classified a watchman? Do you know what a watchman did? A watchman stood on the tower and he was on the lookout for the enemy. He was on the lookout for an attack. He was on the lookout to protect the city or to protect those that he was to be guarding. And you and I, as the body of Christ, should be the priesthood. We should be the watchmen. We should be watching our own lives as well as the lives of our brothers and our sisters and our families. Amen? And as we begin to read in chapter 3 of verse 17, Son of man, I have appointed you a watchman to the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, warn them from me. When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you do not warn him or speak to warn the wicked from him. Now, wait a minute. I know this is the Old Testament. And I know this is irrelevant for today. But people, let me tell you something. There is some relevance still found in the Old Testament. Amen? And whenever you have a heart after God, God is going to touch your heart with a conviction to warn people and to share with a person that they may not want to hear what you want to say. Wicked that he may live, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hands. You see, I do not want to stand before God and give an account of your blood. I don't want to stand before God and have God say, why didn't you love them enough in my heart to share with them and to warn them? Yet if you have warned the wicked and he does not turn from his wickedness or from his wicked ways, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered yourself. People, I love you with all of my heart. But trust me, I'm going to deliver myself. I'm going to be caring about you enough that I will tell you when God asks me to tell you. Again, when a righteous man turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity, 
and I place an obstacle before him. You know what that obstacle is? That is God's discipline. He tries to warn and discipline. And when I place an obstacle before him, he shall die since you have not warned him. He shall die in his sin and his righteous deeds which he has done shall not be remembered, but his blood I will require at your hands. However, if you have warned the righteous man and the righteous shall not sin, He does not sin, he shall surely live because he took the warning and you will have delivered. Why don't we warn? Do we have any excuse whatsoever for not caring and not warning? Do you know why I felt like God wanted to ask you people, are you born again? Have you really, truly got down before God and said, God, I am a sinner. I ask your forgiveness. Have you confessed, literally confessed with your mouth, acknowledging to God that you need Him to come into your life and to rebuild His Spirit in you? Or have you just said, Lord, I believe. I accept that Jesus is the Lord and praise God, I'm on my way. And then with the old carnal mind, you try. You try to correlate God's word with your lifestyle. And whatever doesn't correlate with your lifestyle and your wants, you shove it aside as being legalistic, irrelevant. And we don't begin to catch why someone else is, a, is concerned about a certain aspect of our lifestyle because in us there's no conviction. You see, true love has boundaries. True love will set up limits for our safety and protection from harm. True love will warn you when you get close to crossing or have crossed those boundaries, just like a parent. Can I ask how many of you in here are parents? Can I ask how many of you parents have ever warned your child? Why did you warn them about something? Because you have set boundaries and because you love them. Because you cared for them. Because you did not want them to have harm. Because you did not want the consequences that may come to them to come. So you warn them. And you would warn them before you disciplined them. And the same holds true with our Heavenly Father. He will try And he will do everything he can to warn you before judgment begins. He will do everything he can to bring you into his loving arms and pull you back and pull you close to him. He will bring discipline upon you to try to bring you back. It is actually his heart of love that he warns you. We may not see it as such, but true love always, always warns us before discipline hits. People, God is putting out a warning to His people. He has told us in Malachi chapter 4. I was interesting as I sat in Sunday school class this morning and listened to the Sunday school lesson being taught in Malachi. And the the lesson that Malachi is teaching is that there was a warning to the people that were going out. God was giving warning after warning after warning through Malachi to his people because they were disrespecting his name. They were treating his name as if it was worthless as if it didn't mean anything. And I sat there with amazement in knowing what I felt God had laid on my heart to share with you, but I never said anything much because I did not really feel I had anything to share because it was being mentioned and brought out in such a powerful way 
But one of the things that we see in Malachi is that God said after 400 silent years, God said, I will send my servant Elijah. And he will draw the hearts of the children back to the fathers. And this is why I keep telling you that in these latter days that God is going to send to you those that are under the Spirit on the anointing of Elijah that is not going to be afraid to warn you. They're not going to be afraid they're going to lose your friendship. They're not going to be afraid that you will get angry and mad and leave their church and stop tithing and they will have problems getting enough money to survive. They're going to love you and care about you enough that they're going to do everything they can to get you to check your heart and make sure that God's boundaries has truly been set up in your life and that if you cross those, the conviction of the Holy Spirit lets you know and when He lets you know, you will be quick to fall in essence on your knees and say, God, I am so sorry. Please forgive me. And then get up and go your way and watch those boundaries and be conscious of those boundaries. Why? Because Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 31 says, it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands, in essence, of an angry God. People, it's terrifying for you and I. I've shared this with you before. Some of you will remember, this may be the first time for some of you to hear this. But I did share this a long time ago, once or twice. My dad was called into the ministry. My dad promised God, if God would heal me from epilepsy. I had extreme epileptic seizures from a little child, from just when I was almost born up until the age of 10. I would have grand mal seizures and I would have quite a few of them in the evening. And my mom and dad had my bed in their bedroom so that when I would have one of the seizures, my dad could immediately get out and do what he needed to do because that back then there was that, that uh, fallacy that you'd swallow your tongue. So they would get out to try to grab my tongue to make sure that I didn't swallow it. And I know there are people today that say, boy, I sure wish you'd have swallowed that thing. <laughs> but one night I was in the middle of a seizure and my dad got out of bed and he told me this story so many times. He got out of bed and he came over and he got a hold of me and he laid his hands on me and he said, God, he said, I know that you're a God of healing and I know that you can do anything and there is nothing impossible. And he said, I make a promise to you and a royal commitment. If you will heal my son of this epilepsy, I will go and follow you and I'll be a minister. I'll do anything you want me to do till the day I die. And my dad said it was just like he grabbed hold of an electric fence. He said there was a shock and a bold electricity went through him and he said, instantly I stopped. And I am now 28 years old. <laughs> From that day to this, I've never had an epileptic grand mal seizure. God honored that prayer. But unfortunately, as much as he loved the Lord, and as much as I know that my dad made it into the portals of glory, my dad did not go into the ministry. And my dad told me, he said, "Hun, I can't do it, son. He said, you might be able to do it, but he said, I'll never be able to go. I'll never be able to do it. And my dad did not go into ministry. But one night we were out the barn milking and it was getting a little bit later. And my dad was standing there after we would get the milking machine on the cows. We would stand there and talk. And he was standing there and he had his hand up on the, the milking belt 
uh, ring where we hung the, the bell so we were done. He was standing there looking at the, holding on to that, looking out the window, and there were great big tears rolling down my dad's face. And I never was one much to see my dad ball, even though he was a very sensitive man, and I saw miraculous things that the Spirit of God showed him and did in his life. Trust me, some of the things you would wonder why I lived the way I did when I was a kid before I became a Christian, when God would show him things and he would catch me in lies. But not to, to play that up. I, I just stood there and pretty soon my dad, I said, Dad, are you okay? And he said, yeah. He said, I can't do it, son. He said, I just couldn't do it. And I said, what's that? And he said, follow God the way I promised him. And he said, I, I had a dream. He said, I just had this dream and this vision. And he said, I seen masses and masses and masses of people. And he said, there was a big deep pit all the way across this, this ravine here. He said, you could see it. And he said, you could see the, the, the coloration of the, fa the flames and the fire. He said, you could hear the screams. And he said, you could hear the blood curdling screams. And he said, I watched the people as they were just walking in the hordes up to the edge of this. And then they were just falling in and they would begin to lividly scream with horror. And he said, I stood there and I looked at that and I thought to myself, and he said, I spoke out loud. And he said, I thought, my God, is all of these people lost? And he said that they all turned in a unison at me and pointed their finger and said, yes, and you didn't warn us. You wouldn't tell us. People, we need to come back to the reality. We don't want to try to scare somebody into heaven, amen? Amen. But you and I had better start coming back to the reality and recognizing and understanding there is a hell. And God spoke more about hell than he did heaven. He explained more about hell than he really did heaven. Why would he do that? Because he was more concerned about you being deceived and misled by the enemy and walking down the wrong path when he said there's only one path that leads to eternal life, and that is my way. That is God's way. And to get started on that path, you have to be born again. You don't just say, hey, I believe, woohoo, and just continue living the life you're living. You have to be born again. You have to be born from above by the Spirit of the living God and let His Spirit begin to write the fleshly tablets of your heart and fill it with the Word of God and with His boundaries. Amen? I'm going to ask the worship team and the musicians to come back, if they would, and I'm going to ask you to bow your head with me, please. In some ways... I apologize that I didn't get to the message all the way, but I got to a major part to give you the introduction for next week. But with all heads bowed while the worship team is coming back and the musicians are getting ready, with your head bowed, I want you again to ask yourself the question. Because you know what's amazing? We can pretty much be around someone and we can talk to them about their convictions and we can find out what their convictions is and what their convictions isn't. And we can pretty well tell you whether that person has really truly actually been born again or whether they're living just in the old carnal way believing in God and there is a song that says in his presence in his holy presence there is a fullness of joy you see when you're really born again there's going to be a joy within you and it's not going to be a heartache and it's not going to be a struggle wanting to go to church and be in church you are going to want to be there because you're going to want to try to get everything you can get and grow as close to God as you possibly can. But if you're still operating in the concept of the old man, you're going to find every excuse under the book to try to keep from being in church and around preaching and around teaching and around the Word of God. 
because you don't want that conviction. You see, conviction on someone that's been born again means that they will change. Conviction on someone that hasn't been will irritate them and push them away. And so this morning, as we begin to sing, I want you to bow your head and question your heart. Are you really born again, or are you just a believer? And then we're going to ask you one more time, because people, I do not want anything to happen in this world to you. And you say that you were never warned, and that you were never shown the way. So would you join together while the, while the worship team is singing in His presence? Would you just keep your head bowed and let God's Spirit begin to share with you? Ask God where you really stand. And if you don't know, ask Him how you can become sure. Would you sing with it, please? Your heart will be mended when you have truly walked into the presence of God. Would you sing it one more time in the presence? That's what it means being born again, being born from above is being in the presence of God, God Almighty, that will bring up peace and the troubles of your heart will vanish and your heart will be mended and there will be His laws placed that will bring joy to your spirit. presence, in His holy presence. say something that I hope doesn't confuse you and that you'll grasp and understand. See, when you really begin to come into God's presence and you begin to be born again and born from above and His Spirit begins to enter and write on your heart His laws, it doesn't become an issue, can I, can't I? Should I, should I not? It doesn't become an issue it becomes an issue. How much can I love God? How much can I give up to really show my love to my neighbor? How much am I going to be aware of my neighbor's possible convictions and the weakness maybe of their thoughts in their mind? And I want to make sure, like Paul said, if it makes them to offend, I won't do it because I love them that much. And it doesn't become a hardship. That doesn't become a challenge to want to give something up for the love of God. That doesn't become a challenge. And it doesn't become uh, where we're trying to, to justify what we're doing. It becomes a situation where we do it because we truly have the Spirit of God moving within us, leading us, guiding us, and God's Spirit 
is truly in control. So as we go back and say in his presence, his holy presence, we stop fighting on our own. We stop trying to do it on our own and we start resting in God. We stop worrying about do I do it? Do I not do it? Can I do it? Can't I do it? That doesn't become the issue. The issue becomes God, I want to be restored to your image and I want to love the way you love. And that becomes our hunger and that becomes our thirst. If you're here this morning and you're struggling, maybe at one point you were born again. Maybe at one point you really were on fire of God. But as we sang earlier, Lord, light that fire again. Maybe that's what you need, is you need that fire to be lit again. Whatever it is, I ask you to make sure before you leave this facility. If you don't know what really being born again is, I would be here to help you share with you. Pastor Steve will be here to help you share with you. There will be others to be here help and share with you. Brother Jeff will be here to help and share. My wife will be here to help and share. We will help and share. Sister Arlene, Brother Orn, they'll be here to help you. Sister Connie, Sister Ann Ruther, we'll be here to help you. You just ask. And we will pray with you. We will love you. We will take all of the time in the world because people, time is getting short. Amen. There is judgment coming. Please hear me. Time is short and judgment is coming. We can no longer play games. Now is the time. Today is the day of salvation. Would you stand with us, please? Would you sing one more time in his presence, or in, in the presence, and then the second part, in his presence? In his presence. Everybody sing with us together now. Let's lift our hands in exaltation to the Lord this morning. Holy presence. In his presence. In his holy presence. Now we Matthew chapter 7 verse 21 not everyone who says to me Lord Lord and the reason I want to share this is because there may be somebody here that is thinking you're born again because you're involved you're working in the church in some capacity you're doing something in some capacity because you believe so you think you might have been born again not everyone who says to me Lord Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven but he who does the will of my father who is in heaven. Many will come to me on that day and say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? In your name did we not cast out demons? And in your name did we not perform many miracles? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity, those of you who practice lawlessness. So you see, you may be involved because all of these were involved and they came and said, Lord, didn't we do all these great things? And he said, only those that know the will of my Father. What's the will of the Father? Is that you must be born from above. And you must be conformed to the image of Christ Jesus. And you must be having the Spirit of God write the fleshly tablets of your heart, His laws, and let the conviction lead and guide you down your path. 
So if you're not sure, please don't leave this facility without making sure. Please do not take for granted because you do believe and because you have confessed or you've told somebody you believe, please don't take it for granted that you have truly been born again, but come and ask and confess to the Lord and bow at an altar and say, God, here am I. Would you bow your head for just a moment? Anyone here this morning that would say, in all honesty, Pastor, I thought maybe I was, but I think now as I've been listening that I'm not really possibly actually born again, but that I might just be a believer and I need to confess and I need to ask someone to pray with me and to talk with me. Is there anybody at all that will slip up their hand? Because I do not want you to leave this morning without that opportunity to make a confession of faith to the Lord Jesus Christ. People time's getting too short to play games with God anymore. Father, we thank you for this group, for these people. And we're asking, Master, that if anyone is here, that even though they may not have raised their hand, that at some point they will search out myself, Pastor Steve, they'll search out my wife, they'll search out uh, Brother Jeff, Sister Ann, Rod, Margaret, they'll search someone out. And they'll sit down and they will talk to them. They will search out Connie, they will search out Orrin and Arlene, they will talk with somebody. And Father, I pray that your spirit would lead us and guide us and go with us. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Remember, people, I would much rather you get angry with me than ever be able to stand before God and say, he didn't tell me, he didn't warn me. Love you, go in the admonition of Christ. May God's rest, blessing rest upon you. May God's face smile upon you.